-hmm. is its own, it has its own considerations around volume replacement, and it's sort of a special uh, situation. And then for people who don't appreciate it, Texas is kind of the epicenter of burn research that's been done over the last 50 years. Two big institutions, you have Galveston that had the Shriner Burn Center, and then you had Parkland. And both of them had extensive experience with uh, industry-type burns, mainly around petrochemical stuff. And so they managed to sort of set themselves apart in the world. And it's funny that they're both within the same state when you actually think about it. So we'll talk uh, as much time as we have about the epidemiology, pathophysiology, treatment, characterization, and uh, I'll talk about some of the fluid management, wound care, and then transfer stuff. All right. Um, so in burns, um, when you look at kids less than 14, it's actually one of the top um, traumatic causes of injury, all right? Um, and then about 1% of all ED visits are related to a burn injury, all right? And they account uh, for greater than 100,000 visits to the ED. Um, this is just, I always call this my scary numbers, right? That's the epidemiology or why we care about it. But third leading cause of mortality, five to nine. Eighth, um, in kids less than one, when you think about it. And then when you compare to adult burns, they just are instinctively worse, okay? And some of that has to do with the amount of body surface area you have and the amount of fluid and the amount of reserve that you have. All right, M most tend to be home accidents, and that tends to be the kid reaching up and grabbing something, and that's the vast majority of stuff that we see. The kid wants his mac and cheese, and he's not gonna wait for it to cool. He wants the soup or he's unsupervised um, and they decide to go to the microwave and do it themselves. So they put it in, reach to grab it and it pulls down. And I, I think um, for us more, it's important when we look at that burn, we're kind of remembering um, uh, what the burn looks like and what the story is because we see a lot of burns that are secondary to non-accidental trauma uh, or abuse in our group. So if the burn pattern doesn't really fit with what the family's telling us about a, he pulled it down, but we see it's bilateral feet, then we know it's much more likely to be abuse. All right, 90% can be treated um, in the outpatient world. And then about one out of 20 are gonna be the type of burns that need to be referred to a burn center. So right now uh, we can take any burn um, that's 20% uh, or less. Okay, and then our guidelines really say that once you get into the 20% range or greater, um, that's, when you, um, that's when they're gonna benefit from transfer down to San Antonio, up to Dallas, or if those institutions are full, they can be flown out to Shriners on Galveston Island. All right, so it, those were the scary numbers. The good numbers are when you look at um, so LD50 is, it kills 50% of the people that get exposed to it. So in the 1950s, if you suffered 51% total, total body surface area, 50% of those people would die. And through that work I said over the last 50, 60 years that we've done at Parkland, we've done at Galveston and other bird centers in the US, it's now up to 71%. So you can have a much worse burn and have a much more likely chance of, of surviving. Um, decreased bathtub related scalds and a lot of that has to do with just the setting or the the education around what to set your hot water heater at and so we've been able to decrease bathroom related and then kitchen there's been no decline in those so so just one second at 154 five minutes at only 118 and you can have full thickness burns one of the um one of the more gruesome stories um that came out of the UT shooting was that occurred during a summer day. People were seeking cover behind asphalt and, and one of the injuries that didn't get reported um, was the number of burn injuries that came in to BRAC because these people were seeking cover and it was hot and, um, and they were coming in with full thickness burns. All right, and so what, the, the reason that 15 or 20% tends to be um, the magic number for for referral to a burn center, is that when you, that's when you get in to this sort of um, systemic response that then causes leaky capillaries. 
that fluid replacement is much, much bigger than what you would assume with say a hemorrhagic kind of injury. Um, and then you get into these issues of myocard, decreased heart activity, vasoconstriction. And then once you get up into this 40 and 60 range, uh, that's almost like an ARDS type picture or a, a septic picture that you're gonna get. All right, real quick, just zone. So we talk about the central zone, the zone of stasis, and this zone of hyperemia. And so everything that we do for that initial resuscitation with fluids is you're trying to get perfusion back to this, this zone of stasis here so that the center part doesn't expand, all right? So you can, it's kind of hard to see, but so you have this light pink zone. What you wanna do is aggressively resuscitate these people. You wanna get perfusion back to this area so you still have that tiny little center area that's gonna be called the zone of coagulation. Everything around it can resolve. But if you don't intervene, then the center spot sort of expands and you increase the amount of burn that's gonna be consequential or is gonna scar. What did I tell you earlier? You're not gonna get through a talk with somebody who's emergency medicine trained and I'm gonna have a slide about the ABCs. You're always gonna have to remember airway and breathing in these cases. And even in burns where you don't have a lot of total, uh, total body surface area compromise, one of the other indications for us to transfer to a burn center is if we feel they have uh, inhalation injury. <clears throat> You'll also see in this population special consideration given to early intubation in our department. And so singed nasal hair, the classic soot in the back of the mouth, um, any other type of patient, you look at them and you like, well, they're talking, why are you about to do rapid sequence on this guy? Well, we know that they can decompensate pretty quickly. And um, it's, also a, it's also a patient population where you'll see us using more ketamine as our induction agent uh, when we're going to rapid sequence these people because we know it protects their airway. Some people argue it has a dilatory effect in the lungs. And then you can actually transfer them over to a drip for the transfer to a burn center. So it, one of the things, so in the, a few minutes ago, I talked about how helpful it is when we get a, a, a real number of fluid, of how much fluid's been given in the field. And that is in a, in a slide, I'll show you why, because we have to take into consideration sometimes what you guys have given in the field when we're calculating total volume replacement in these patients. And um, if we miss that, then we can sort of over, um, um, over replete them and then we get into issues of pulmonary edema and ARDS and if we don't take it into account then we have the potential or sorry if we overestimate that amount that we can potentially under resuscitate them and then that zone of coagulation can expand and, and they're not quite going to be as volume resuscitated as they need to be. So people have gotten away too from this idea of um, uh, uh, you, you, I use the word full thickness. So um, we use that now more than we do some of the older terms. So this is sort of a superficial partial thickness. So this used to be um, just our, our typical bulla. There's some denuding deep partial thickness. You can kind of see the underlying uh, fat and tissue. And then full thickness, you get all the way down into the fat, all right? So if you get back to this type of picture, this is that hyperemia where you wanna make sure that kids are resuscitated well so that an initial part of that doesn't expand. All right, so you wanna minimize the amount of tissue that's at, um, at play there. Um, these are sort of the superficial, superficial par partial thickness, deep partial full. Um, when you get down to some of those full thickness burns where you're seeing the fat, um, you know, it can take up to two months to heal. Um, the other thing about full thickness that kind of gives it away is every other patient in here is gonna be in extreme pain. I mean, anybody that's had any burn remembers is one of the most traumatic things they've ever had, all right? I mean, it is painful. Um, and that's the scary part when you see full thickness burns. You look at this burn that you think that you, you need to go get some internasal fentanyl because you feel that uncomfortable and that kid's just sitting there. And it's because the underlying nerve endings are completely 
burned at that point. So, so they, they have no sensation there. And they're going to have, ac you guys are going to have access to these talks too, right? Okay. Because I'm not going to read a slide to you when you guys can, can get to it. So um, unlike the rules of sevens in kids, or the, sorry, the rules of nine, in kids we tend to use more of a nine in kid chart because once again, their um, extremities in proportion to their trunk is not the same as an adult. And so on our sort of burn flow sheets, we have this where we can actually mark stuff off. Um, and then once you get up to about the age of 15, then the rule of nines can apply. Yeah, how good are we at estimating total body surface area? We're horrible at it. I, I, and I put myself in that category. Some of it has to do with the fact that we're looking at an initial burn. And so some of that superficial stuff you may think is partial thickness. And you really don't know what's going to happen until you've got about a 24 hour period or that burn evolves over time. But I've had, uh, you know, I've sent burns down to San Antonio where my estimate was 25%. And I get kind of the nasty gram the next day that says, well, when we saw them, we thought it was only 12%. So why'd you transfer them? And well, it's because when I saw him, he was bright red from his burn. <laughs> And then we kind of break it down into minor, moderate, and severe. Um, and that severe is that greater than 20% or 10% full thickness. Um, and then we have other special cases where we're gonna transfer these kids. And mainly it's any kind of circumferential burn. They're at a much higher risk for contracture um, and uh, a need of fasciotomy. And then if it's in the perineal region, uh, face or feet, we tend, to, we tend to at least consult with the burn center and then we will call and talk to our plastics people ability to take care of this burn and some of our guys are much more comfortable with burns so can handle that others will be shipping out so if it's less than 20 percent for fluid resuscitation really it's just oral hydration all right um, and then for greater than 20 percent and this is what I said about go Texas we the two formulas in the entire world both come from our state, which it is fascinating. Um, Galveston uh, was sort of the first. Parkland sort of picked up in the 70s. Most people now use a Parkland formula for, for fluid resuscitation. Not that I'm banging on Galveston or anything. The Parkland formula, though, is also, I think, a little bit of the easiest one, which is four mils times total body surface area times kilogram plus maintenance. And then the key to this is you want to give the first half of that in the first eight hours and then the remaining half over the next 16. And once again, the key there, the, the physiology behind that is you want to get enough fluid so you're getting enough perfusion of that area that could be at compromise. So you get fluid, you get some dilation, you get some blood flow in there, and then that central zone of coagulation instead of expanding is just going to stay what it is. And then it's imperative to have an accurate um, TBSA on this. And so I, I really think that that's why the charts are having a little, uh, I don't know, I've probably got eight little things on my ID badge, uh, but one of them is that, um, that Lunt uh, kid picture that helps me figure it out. All right, controversies. Um, there was some evidence that kids less than 10, the Galveston formula had better outcomes. There's never been a head-to-head -head trial between a Gal the Galveston resuscitation or the Parkland. 90% um, uh, now of burn centers use Parkland. And then people have argued whether or not normal saline versus LR is the preferred solution. Um, and there's never been a head-to-head -head trial. Um, out of that same, um, the same sort of uh, burn survey down here. 63% of the institutions use LR. All right, colloid, so albumin. You know, some people have argued that, well, if you're gonna be giving a lot of IV fluid to these people, then if you give something like uh, albumin or some of the other expanders that you're gonna get better outcomes, no benefit. And then there's been some, um, some promising results around hypertonic saline. Um, and that is still ongoing, and that would be in severe burns, all of which are transferred to a burn center. All right. 
not so much for us in the ED or pre-hospital, but the way that you're measuring resuscitation in these patients is a little bit different, and that's gonna be urine output. And because of, in some of these bigger burns, greater than 20%, you're gonna be shutting down kidneys because of decreased perfusion. So you really want this one to two mils per kilo per hour. Um, and then some people are using CVPs. There's a couple of institutions that use, that use swan GANs. None of those have really, um, uh, the swan GANs have never been able to show any improvement. Some people that use the CVP uh, has, there's one big cohort trial that said it was a little bit better. Yeah, we'll keep going. So uh, initial care is just gonna be tap water um, and that initial cooling can be effective up to 60 minutes. So I sort of focused early on this idea of giving a bunch of fluid to make sure that that um, that the zone that's at risk for a progression of the burn. Well, the other part of that is removing any sort of uh, thermal injury. And so the cooling part, removal of affecting clothes, constricting jewelry. Um, what we do is um, cool but not cold is key. And then we'll use um, a sheet, just one of our clean sheets. There's debate around some of these partial thickness. Uh, you don't want to use chlorhexidine when you're cleaning these. Saline's preferable. And then if you get a bunch of people who like burns, people get into fist fights about whether or not you're supposed to remove the blisters or not. <laughs> and the evidence there says um, that if it's greater than this one centimeter squared, you're gonna have some, you're gonna have some better outcomes if you sort of denude those. And so, what, what, back again, this is partial thickness. This is extremely painful. And so, um, what we do with these is almost universally use ketamine in these kids. And so, we'll give anywhere between uh, one to two per kilo. Um, I'm, I tend to be a little heavy-handed with ketamine. Um, so, I almost always will do two per kilo with these type of things because it's extremely painful and you want to get a good, you want to get all that dead tissue off if you're going to go down the route of taking those blisters off. Uh, what do you put on them? Um, there's no evidence that, that there's, there was this one great study out of India one time that looked at if you applied honey versus nothing, um, did it get better? And so there was no difference. And then there was another study out of Southeast Asia where they used um, uh, potatoes, they cut up potatoes and put them on the burn. I don't think that there's anything magical about honey or potatoes, but I think the crux of that is there's certain burns that no matter what you do and they're, they're less than 20%, they're gonna get better, all right? So, and it doesn't matter if it's gonna be a Neosporin or Bactroban or honey or, or potatoes on those. Um, these are, the, oh, I forgot I put that on there actually, sorry. The, the honey column in terms of what you can, what you can uh, put on there. Um, bacitracin, the, the trouble with using uh, the silver is that uh, once you apply it, you can't use some of the other biological dressings that we like to use on these bigger burns. Um, um, and then in honey, you have to worry about ants. I'm just kidding, sorry, <laughs> couldn't resist. Um, so anyway, what this says is, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it, it probably doesn't, it's probably not gonna matter. And then we have a whole sort of, um, for some of these bigger burns, not quite 20%, we have a whole bunch of different um, biological dressings or occlusive dressings that we can use. And some of these are really, really uh, impressive. We've went through now several, right now at Dell we're using Mepilex, Mepilex now? Yeah, we used to use BioBrain. And as you can tell though, the cost of some of these, especially the BioBrain is pretty high. And what those would do and what a lot of these do is actually bind to the burn base and then allows healing to occur uh, in a way that we weren't able to do say 20 years ago or so. Wound care full thickness is surgery. Um, and then pain control. So we talked about this uh, a minute ago. So at least with that initial debridement, usually you guys are, are fantastic about uh, internasals if you have them. Um, that's a great way to start, but almost always these kids need more aggressive uh, pain control, and that's where we'll go to a ketamine. And then we're getting a little bit better, I think, about using ketamine as an adjunct for acute pain control. 
Don't forget the life-saving tetanus. You know, that's what we joke in the emergency department. You can do everything right in one of our trauma resuscitations, but then one of the auditors is gonna come and tell me that I forgot to give the, uh, I forgot to give the tetanus and I, I do my best to keep a very serene look on my face and kind of nod and tell them how much I appreciate the feedback and how I'm gonna improve my service going forward. <laughs> but that's not my inner dialogue at all. Um, and then this is just some of the indications for transfer to a burn center. So um, this is, if you look at the American Burn Association, they will say partial thickness greater than 10%, all right? So if it's on a test for some reason, our institution feels that we'll take, we can take any kid uh, as long as they're less than 20. So that's more a, a, a ours. Uh, this full thickness burns to these high-risk areas, electrical burns, um, inhalation burns. Um, and then this pre-existing, you're not gonna see this as much in kids, but diabetics, peripheral vascular disease from hypertension, sort of things that are gonna impair healing. Um.